brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. If Advent is the preparation for the coming of the Lord, and if Advent has an apocalyptic nature to it, as Vigano and Burke and, well, any of the great saints of the church in past times would have told you, then we must prepare ourselves accordingly. And what is the best way for that? Well, that is to become saints. And all of that begins with prayer. A couple of weeks ago, I presented uh, Father Michael Mueller's work on heresy and how there is about there is no salvation outside the church, a teaching that many priests a century later would repeat verbatim from him and would get in trouble with the Holy See because modernism was creeping into the church and even into the hierarchy well before the council. Now I have his thoughts on prayer. It's part one of a very long work he has, and so I'm not going to bore you with the entirety of that work in one sitting, but I think you'll find this edifying. Let me know what you think at the end. God bless. Prayer, the Key to Salvation, by Father Michael Mueller, Chapter 1. There is an important truth of which thousands of men are ignorant, or if they know it, they reflect upon it seldom and with little fruit. Yet the knowledge of this truth is almost as necessary for those who have attained the age of reason, as it is for them to know that there is only one God in three persons, and that the second person became man to redeem and save us. The importance and necessity of this great truth seems to be a mystery, not to heathens, our elder brothers, and heretics only, but also to the greater part of Christians, nay, even to many of those who have especially consecrated themselves to God. We often hear in sermons and read in pious books of the necessity of avoiding bad company, of hating sin, of forgiving injuries, and of being reconciled with our enemies. But seldom are we taught this great truth. Or if it is sometimes spoken of, rarely is it done in a manner with that interior conviction calculated to leave upon our minds and hearts a convincing and lasting impression of its great importance and necessity. Now this truth is, morally speaking, or according to the ordinary source of divine providence. Man cannot be saved without prayer. In order to understand this full truth in extent, we must consider, first, that man cannot be saved unless he will have done God's will. Secondly, that man is unable to do God's will unless he is assisted by divine grace. Thirdly, that man obtains this grace by prayer only, that consequently man must pray in order to be saved. First, I say, man cannot be saved unless he will have done God's will on earth. The Lord declared this will in express terms when he said to Adam, And of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in what day soever thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt die the death. See Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. By this commandment man was evidently given to understand that the continuation of his happiness for time and eternity depended upon his obedience to the will of God. To be undisturbed by any irregular affections or disorderly passions, and to perpetuate his happiness to his posterity, was entirely optional with him. If he made a right use of his liberty, by always following the law and will of God, if he bore unsullied the image and likeness of his Creator as a true son of his Father, to whom he owed filial affection as a good servant to his Master, whom he was to fear and honor as a brave soldier of his king, to whom he owed fidelity, as a wise steward and administrator of the goods of his lord. In fine, if he made proper use of the creatures confided to his care and dispensation, then he would receive the crown of life everlasting, in reward for his fidelity to the law and will of his creator. But to swerve from this divine will for one moment only, thus declaring himself independent of it, as it were, would be subjecting himself to the law of God's justice, which would not fail to execute the threatened punishment. Did God afterwards, in consideration of the most abundant efficacy of the redemption, lay down other and easier conditions for man's happiness and salvation? He did not change his will one jot. Man's happiness was to depend on his obedience and submission to the divine will. 
Now if thou wilt hear the voice of the Lord thy God to do and keep all his commandments, the Lord thy God will make thee higher than all the nations that are on the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, yet so if thou hear his precepts. And Jesus Christ, the restorer of grace, says, You are my friends if you do the things that I command you. And again, not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He himself gave the example, having been obedient even unto the death of the cross, thereby teaching all men that their salvation depends on their persevering obedience to the will of their heavenly Father, who sent the Redeemer not only to ransom their souls, but also to show them the true road to heaven by revealing to them the will of his Father. Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, appointed the apostles, and especially Peter, to succeed him in his office of teaching God's will. Where Peter and the apostles are found in their lawful successors, there only is this true and entire will of God taught, and those only who embrace and follow it faithfully have well-founded hopes of salvation. Those who follow any other rule to obtain salvation deceive themselves, Instead of God's will, they do their own, or follow the suggestions of the devil of the, or those evil-minded, twisted teachers who substitute their own will, their own meditations, thoughts, opinions, and judgment for the will of God. They imitate Adam and Eve who believe the devil's suggestions rather than the infallible word of God. This great truth, that man must do God's will in order to be saved, should ever be remembered by all those who wish to walk sincerely before God and to save their souls. But the mere knowledge and remembrance of it will not contribute to their salvation any more than this same knowledge and remembrance did to the salvation of our first parents. Besides this truth, another, no less important, must be borne in mind, namely, always to be mindful of God's will, always to honor, appreciate, and love it above all things, always to understand that to embrace and follow it most punctually, cheerfully, and promptly, is to embrace inseparably eternal happiness in the very source of life, always to see clearly that whatever is contrary to it can never be good or meritorious, nay, must be death to the soul, and to return to it after having left it, to cling to it when in possession of it, is in thyself by no means the work of human strength, but it's absolutely the effect of, of divine grace. For if faith teaches us that God made all things very good, it also teaches us that they cannot remain so of themselves without God's assistance, as otherwise they would cease to be dependent on him, which is just as impossible for us to imagine as it is to believe a logical conclusion could be right without premises, or that a river could flow perpetually without a never-failing source. It is the Lord who must preserve them in their good condition, especially rational creatures, men, because, by their own free will, they have it in their power to swerve from God's will and law. For this reason, Jesus Christ said, Without me you can do nothing. On which words St. Augustine remarks that Jesus Christ did not say, Without me you cannot accomplish anything. But he said, You cannot do anything. He means to say that without his grace we are not even able to commend any good work. If this light of faith, said our Lord to St. Catherine of Siena, shineth to thee, thou wilt understand that I, thy God, know better how to promote thy welfare, and have a greater desire to do so than thou thyself, and at thou, without my grace, neither wouldst thou couldst promote it. This very thing is taught by St. Paul. In his second epistle to the Corinthians, he writes thus, Not that we are sufficient to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. The apostle means to say that, of course, we are not even able to think of any good meritorious thing. Now, if we are not able to think of anything good, how much less able are we to wish for anything good? It is God, he writes in his epistle to the Philippians, who worketh in you both the will and to, to accomplish his good will. The same thing had long before been declared by God through the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel. I will cause you to walk in my commandments and keep my judgments and do them. Consequently, according to the teachings of St. Leo I, man works only so much good as God, by his grace, grants him to work. Hence, it is an article of our holy faith 
condemning the erroneous doctrine of Pelagius that no one can do the least good work with merit for heaven without God's particular grace and assistance. All this being true, shall we believe that the fall of our first parents and the sins of all their descendants cannot be imputed to them, saying that as God did not keep them good by making them honor, love, and follow his will and law, they could not help losing his grace and so many natural and supernatural gifts. To maintain this would undoubtedly be the height of blasphemy. Hence, we must necessarily come to the following conclusion. It is certain first that man is good in the sight of God and has well-founded hopes of salvation, only in proportion as he lives up to the will of God. Secondly, that man cannot by his own power keep his will good, so as always to follow God's will under all circumstances. God, therefore, must have given him an infallible means, by the use of which he can preserve his innocence, or by the neglect of which he will become guilty before God. The use of this means must be considered as a third great and essential truth in the way of salvation. Now, common sense tells every person to call for the assistance of another, where his own means are insufficient to preserve or obtain a necessary thing. Adam and Eve knew this truth very well, but neglected to call for God's assistance, especially when put to trial. They lacked the efficacious grace necessary to render their will firm in keeping the commandments of God, and thus preserve all their temporal and spiritual happiness. Hence, their fall was their own fault. We may then fairly conclude that the whole mystery of man's salvation and sanctification depends entirely on his constant and proper use of this means of prayer. As God, in the natural order, says St. Alphonsus, ordained that man should be born naked and in want of many th things necessary for life, and as at the same time he has given him hands and understanding to clothe himself and provide for his other necessities, so, in the supernatural order, man is born unable to remain good and obtain salvation by his own strength. But God, in his infinite goodness, granting to every one the grace of prayer, wishes him to make constant use of this grace, in order to thereby obtain all other graces which he needs to be enabled to keep the commandments of the Lord and be saved. Prayer is indeed a universal and infallible means for man to keep up his relation between his Creator and himself. Now this is, first, a relation of continual dependence on God's goodness. By praying, man professes his belief in this dependence. As the subjects of a king acknowledge their dependence on their sovereign by paying the taxes he lays upon them, so by offering up to the Almighty the tribute of his prayer, man acknowledges himself to be a constant mendicant before his Creator, always depending on God's goodness for food, protection, and preservation, both temporal and spiritual. Secondly, it is a relation of faith. Man does not see his Lord and God, yet he must not on that account less firmly believe in him. By praying, he professes his faith in an omnipotent, most wise, most bountiful God, believing that the Lord knows and is able to grant what is asked of him. Thirdly, it's a relation of hope. Man should hope that God will give him all the necessities of life here below, and life everlasting in the world to come. By praying to the Lord, he professes his hope in a most benevolent God, trusting that he will really receive from him everything necessary in time and in eternity. What often troubles and disquiets so many souls is the uncertainty of their salvation. But according to the Apostle, our hope for salvation ought to be immovable, firm, and secure. It will be so undoubtedly if it rests upon two certain foundations, one on the part of God and the other on the part of man. The certain foundation, or certain motives on the part of God on which our hope of salvation rests, are the power, the mercy, and the truth of God. And of these, the strongest and most certain motive is God's infallible faithfulness to his promises which he had made to us through the merits of Jesus Christ, to save us and give us the graces necessary for our salvation. This promise, I say, is the strongest of all the motives of our hope of salvation, because though we might believe God to be infinite in power and mercy, nevertheless, as Juvino well observes, we could not feel confident of God, saving us unless he had given us the certain promises of doing so. But this infallible promise of God will not be fulfilled unless we pray to him for our salvation. Hence, the foundation of our hope for salvation will be certain on our part if we pray to God for his grace and for faithful cooperation with it. As our hope of salvation rests upon an immovable, firm, and secure foundation on the part of God, 
and God giving everyone the grace to pray. No one can reasonably fear to be lost if he really perseveres in prayer for his salvation. With St. Alphonsus, he may say in truth, I never feel more confident of my salvation than when praying. This is easy to understand. My confidence to obtain from my friend what he has promised to me will be so much the greater, the better I know his power, goodness, and fidelity in keeping his promises. Now, the oftener I speak to my friend, the better will I become acquainted with his virtues. Prayer being conversation with God, my confidence in him will increase so much the more, the oftener I speak to him in prayer, in which he will deign to make himself known to me, as he has promised in the Gospel of St. John. Thus, prayer is truly the mother and nurse of hope. Fourthly, it is a relation of charity. By prayer, man keeps up and increases this golden virtue, which is the queen of all virtues. Prayer brings the soul near to God. It is like the magnetic fluid which passes over the telegraph wire from one operator to another. By its means, they communicate to each other different affairs in the same instant, on account of the swiftness with which the fluid passes. They may thus be considered to be close together, although they are very really distant from each other. Prayer brings man closer to God than the magnetic fluid does to telegraph operators, the swiftness of the former being far greater than that of the latter. Through this conductor of prayer, man sends to God all his messages for temporal and spiritual necessities, and in a moment all the gifts and treasures of grace are sent, in return to the soul of man, the likeness and image of the great and perfect original. Who can doubt that, by this close intercourse of the soul with God, the fire of divine love will be enkindled and increased in a most wonderful manner? Fifthly, the relation between God and man is that of a father to his son. Now God, as father, feels an unspeakable desire to communicate his benefits to man. My delight is to be with the children of men. By the constant use of prayer, man is to furnish God with frequent opportunities to make known to him his ineffable sweetness, and communicate to him the gifts of his inexhaustible treasures, requiring for them no more than the price of his prayer, notwithstanding their infinite value. This infinite desire of God bestows upon his image and likeness, the richness of his divinity, will manifest itself to excess in heaven. The Lord created man to be the head, king, and crown of nature, but he himself wishes to be man's crown in heaven. And I shall buy thy exceedingly great reward, he said to Abraham. On the part of man, this crown should be merit for having done freely and faithfully God's will on earth. On the part of God, it should be grace, and therefore all the honor and glory thereof should rebound to him. By prayer, this twofold end is obtained also, for by it man obtains and preserves the good will always to live up to God's holy will. But prayer, being a gratuitous gift of the Lord, all its effects must be so likewise, effects partaking of the nature of their cause. Hence, according to St. Augustine, the Lord rewarding man in heaven for his free submission to the divine will on earth, by bestowing himself upon man, the original upon its likeness, does nothing else than crown himself, as it were, man's creation, meritorious life and happy death, being altogether the gratuitous gift and effect of his unbounded love for his image and likeness. Thus it is true what St. Paul says, What hast thou that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received? For of him and by him and in him are all things, to him be glory forever. Amen. O great and admirable wisdom of God, which has established for man salvation and sanctification so easy and in so infallible a means as that of prayer, what can be more important and more essential for man than the faithful fulfillment of this duty of praying? And yet strange and painful to say, what is less understood, less anxiously attended to that than duty? The neglect, forgetfulness, or ill performance of this duty has ever been the true source of all moral evils, even of infidelity and idolatry themselves. The more man neglects to communicate with God the true life of his soul, the more he will experience the weakness of his will to resist sin and vice. His passions, the temptations of the devil, and the allurements of the world will draw him headlong from one abyss of religious error and moral evils into another. When in imminent danger of death or of a considerable loss of fortune, as, for instance, shipwreck or fire or the like, the greater part of men will, indeed, remember their duty of praying to God as the only one who can save them from death. In such dangers, even infidels will take off the mask of their infidelity and make a profession of faith in an omnipotent God crying out, Lord, save us, we are perishing. 
Lord, have mercy on us. Spare our lives. Save us from this fatal accident. This case accepted the most of men do not care for prayer. Would to God they loved their souls as much as their bodies and the perishable goods of this world. Would to God they understood the danger in which they are of being damned to the everlasting pains of hell. Certainly they would just as naturally feel impelled to pray to the Almighty for the grace of their conversion and final salvation. But alas, they love the darkness of their evil ways more than the necessary practice of the precept of prayer. Hence, as the Lord in the Old Testament found it necessary to give his people the precepts of the Decalogue, not indeed as new laws, but rather as a renewal and development of the law of nature, the divine light of which was obscured and almost extinguished by the crimes and perversity of man. So, in like manner, the same Lord of all goodness, who never delights in the spiritual death of man, but wishes, like a celebrated artist, to see, by means of prayer, the natural freshness of life preserved in his own image and likeness, in the soul of man, the masterpiece of creation. The Lord, I say, has never failed to call man's attention to the importance and necessity of this practical truth. He has declared in it in the most distinct language on almost every page of Holy Scripture. Seek ye the Lord, he says by the royal prophet, and be strengthened. Seek his face evermore. Let nothing keep thee from praying always. What God inculcated so clearly in the old law is still more clearly and more forcibly inculcated by Jesus Christ in the new law. And he spoke a parable to them that they ought always to pray and not to faint. And again, watch ye and pray. This precept, always to pray and not faint, was taught and emphatically inculcated in his name by the apostles also. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer, says St. Peter. By all prayer and supplication, writes St. Paul to the Ephesians, praying at all times in spirit and in the same, watching with all instance and supplication for all saints. And again, be instant in prayer, watching it in thanksgiving. And to the Thessalonians, he writes, pray without ceasing. And to his beloved disciple, Timothy, I will therefore that man and pray in every place, lifting up pure hands without anger and contention. Can the necessity of prayer be more clearly and more forcibly expressed than it is in these passages of Holy Scripture? It is not said in any of them that it is well to pray, or that you may pray, you are at liberty to do so, and the like. No, in most distinct language it is said, you must pray. Pray. Neither is it said, you must pray now and then. No, but you must pray always without ceasing. You must not faint in prayer. You must watch in it at all times and in all places. All these expressions imply, according to St. Alphonsus and other theologians of the Church, a formal precept of God to pray, so much so that, in their opinion, a man who would not pray for a month could not be excused from mortal sin. Had we then no other evidence for believing in the necessity of prayer than the fact that Jesus Christ and his apostles have always inculcated and insisted upon it with so much force, this fact alone ought to be sufficient to convince us of its necessity and make us profess our practical belief in it by continual application to this holy exercise. For as we firmly believe that there are three persons in God without requiring any other evidence, for this belief than the certainty of the fact that Jesus Christ himself taught this truth, so in like manner ought we to be firmly convinced of the necessity of prayer, for the simple reason that Jesus Christ himself taught it in most express and clear language, because being God and truth itself, he could never have taught anything to be necessary unless it were really so. But as there is no more persuasive way of instruction than by example, our Lord Jesus Christ adopted this mode of teaching us the necessity of prayer, even before he taught it by his word. It is not truly strange and surprising to behold the Son of God, eternal wisdom itself, who came into this world to teach men the way of salvation, to instruct them in the truths of eternal life, who in his childhood might have preached and wrought miracles for the conversion of sinners just as easily as in his advanced age of thirty years. It is not very surprising, I say, to see him spend thirty years in retirement and obscurity, unknown to the world, and losing according to our manner of judging, his precious time in life, which it would seem would have been spent more profitably in teaching men and converting them from their evil ways. But if a wise man does nothing without a wise intention, how wise then must have been the intention of Jesus Christ, supreme wisdom itself, in spending thirty years of his life in retirement and solitude, and three years only in teaching publicly? Truly, whosoever does not feel struck by this fact in our Savior's life must never have seriously reflected upon it, or must feel quite indifferent towards whatever he has done for us during his mortal career. Now, what was his principal occupation during the space of thirty years? It was prayer, continual prayer. 
No one, however, will believe and say that Jesus Christ stood in need of it, but it was necessary that we should learn the necessity of prayer for our salvation, and be convinced of it more by his example than by his words. Thirty years of his life were consecrated to this holy exercise, and three years only to the instruction of the people. And even of this short period of three years, he spent the greater part in prayer. How often did he not say to his disciples, Withdraw a little from the multitude, and for what purpose, in order to be more at liberty to pray? Moreover, we do we not re read in the gospel that, after having spent the day instructing the people, he would retire to a lonesome mountain, there to spend the whole night in prayer? And it came to pass that he went on into a mountain to pray, and passed the whole night in the prayer of God. This was a custom of our Savior, as we may gather from the fact that Judas, the traitor, did not go with soldiers to seek him in the city of Jerusalem, but went straight on to the Mount of Olives, because he knew that Jesus was accustomed to go to that place to pray during the night. Again, wishing to be glorified by his heavenly Father, he prayed for it. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son. On this prayer, Father Crasset S.J. comments, Jesus prays his Father to glorify his body. Was it not his due? Had he not merited it? Could his Father refuse him? Why did he ask it? God did not design to grant any favor to man, not even to his divine Son, except by means of prayer, which is the channel through which all graces flow. As my Son, saith he, all the nations of the earth, and I will give them to thee for thy inheritance. Jesus merited the empire of the whole universe, notwithstanding which he obtained it only after asking it. And how did he close his life on earth? Was it not by most touching prayer? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thus his life from the beginning to the end was but a continual practice of prayer. His glorious life is not less so. He still continues to pray for us in heaven, according to St. Paul, who also intercedes for us with his heavenly Father. He has been doing this for more than 1,800 years, and he will continue to do so to the end of the world. He likewise intercedes for us in the sacrifice of the Mass. For Mass is, according to the doctrine of the Catholic Church, a sacrifice of impetration, in which Jesus Christ asks of his Heavenly Father everything necessary for our temporal and spiritual welfare. Now, if we consider that Mass is said at every hour of the day, it follows that Jesus Christ, for more than 1,800 years, has been praying for us under the sacramental species, and that he will continue to do so at every hour until the end of the world. Truly, if this example of our Savior does not open the eyes of our understanding and convince us of the necessity of prayer, it will be in vain to look for other or more striking proofs in support and confirmation of this truth. Hence, St. Augustine remarks, If Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, happy in and by himself, and standing in no need of anything whatsoever, prays, shall man, misery itself, not pray. Jesus Christ, our, div our divine teacher, lies prostrate in prayer, and man, sick in body and soul, should not humble himself to pray. Jesus Christ, innocent itself, prays, and man, laden with sin, should not pray. Jesus Christ, the judge of the living and the dead, prays, and guilty man should not pray. St. Augustine means to say that Jesus Christ came into this world to instruct us, both by his words and example. I have given you an example, that as I have done, so do you also. And to leave this example of his unnoticed, as it were, is to have lost common sense, to forsake the order of God's goodness, in order to enter into that of his justice, to leave him as a friend, in order to have him for an enemy, to give up the ways of his consolation, in order to enter into those of his severity, to fly from his benefits and will, in order to fall under the effects of his powerful will. Not to follow our Lord's example in prayer is to make all our steps wandering, our paths perilous, our plans illusions, our works useless, our pleasures miseries, our prosperity chastisement, our adversity and afflictions despair, our existence a hell, wherein we shall only know bitter tears and sighs. On the contrary, to follow this example is to place ourselves in perpetual rest and security, to oblige the wisdom of God to govern us, his power to defend us, his goodness to console us, his grace to sanctify us, his mercy to encompass us, his sanctity to purify us, his happiness to defend us from evil and sustain us in good, and to make all succeed and go well with us, according to our wishes, for time and eternity. That's an interesting reflection for Advent, I think, as we prepare for the coming of our blessed Lord, and in life as we perhaps come for, prepare for his second coming, though when that will be is not for us to know.
take these take the lesson with you and uh, work on your prayer life. This is one of the best times of year to do it. Have a blessed Advent. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.